Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would meld our spirit with yours, that we might have insight and wisdom, grace and favor as we walk with you during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go ahead and have a seat if you would and take a Bible. And uh, we're going to have kind of a Bible drill this morning. I don't normally do this either, but we're going to bounce around from scriptures. If you don't have time to get to that scripture and, and focus on it in the page, just jot down the, the scripture, scripture reference. Uh, and that will help you a lot. The first uh, scripture that we're going to start with is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. As we think about that, I want to share something with you. And, and I want to ask your opinion. Those of you uh, listening online, you can kind of put your opinion together. Um, wouldn't it be nice if life were fair? You know, I'd like for life to be fair at times. I, I, look at, I look at things that happen and I look at our world. And to be honest, there's a lot of unfairness happening right now in our world. And I think we're a little bit afraid to just call out and say that's unfair. Partly because some of us are, are, are wanting to be encouraging. Some of us want to be uh, uplifting. And, and some of us don't want to be uh, confronted with what necessarily that unfairness is. Uh, there's a lot of reasons, but, but sometimes things just aren't fair. I'm going to give you a little insight into one of them that I, I feel like isn't fair and then kind of stretch it to where it fits you. Um, as most of you know, I run marathons and run quite a bit and uh, have had some health issues the last five or six months, probably six months. Got a lot of those straightened out, but one of them that I can't, I, I'm still working on is uh, my blood pressure. Now, if you were to check my pulse right at this moment, I bet it would be in the mid-50s. It's pretty good, right? I run, I try to do the things that, that are uh, necessary to, to be healthy, and I know people, most of us know people, who they don't exercise at all. And their blood pressure is great. That's not fair. <laughs> they can eat whatever they want. They can binge watch whatever series they want. That's not fair. And some of us are going to say, well, that's genetics. Is it? I don't think so. If you were to look at the statistics, I believe that they would tell you that over the last 10 years, a lot of those who deal with health issues are dealing with health issues and they're the first ones in their lineage to deal with those particular issues. I know somebody, and this is going to sound bad, I know somebody that's 30 pounds overweight. Now you're thinking, well, 30 pounds isn't that much, and it's really not that much in a lot of arenas. But their blood pressure is phenomenal. I, I know somebody that's 100 pounds overweight maybe a little more. And their cholesterol levels are awesome. They don't have diabetes. No, not diabetic. They, they eat what they want, when they want, how they want, as much as they want. I know somebody else that looks like a bean pole. Probably doesn't weigh 135 pounds. Maybe 140. Be generous. 140 pounds. And they are diabetic and have high cholesterol. I know this is getting redundant, but that's not fair. It's not fair at all. I know people who, who deal with, and, and some of us would say it's geographical, but I know people that are dealing with cancer. And if you've ever been around or had to deal with cancer, cancer is not fair. Does not care about being fair. Never has cared about being fair. But you need to understand something. And normally I'm, I, when I bring a message and, and God places them, all right, there's some of it that's trying to encourage you to make a decision. That's the same today. But there are some of it that's just facts. You're going to get some facts today. Because you know what's missing in our world today? Facts. We've gotten the idea that emotion or a lot of things can drive us and we don't even listen to science. Facts. You don't have to cheer about that when you can write, write that one down. Like. <laughs> when I think about things though, I think about how confusing and, and how tr sometimes true things, factual things, can be confusing. You can write this one down. I didn't come up with this, but I really enjoyed it. Um, there's a guy named Edward Dennison. And in 1960, he said, and he, he's accurate. You can kind of do the math on this. Any of you like math other than Justin and Larry? Uh, that's the two of us in here. Uh, two of them, not us, sorry. Um, but if you, if you said, he said 3% exceeds 2% by 50%. That's true. See, I, I got a simple mind. If it's three and two, that's 1%, right? No, it's 50% difference. And in, the, 
in the mathematics of things, in the calculations of things, there are certain things that we calculate and say, I get that. There are other things that are just a given. Now, I'm going to tell you the first given of the day. The, the given that I'm operating off of and the premise that is true is that God's in control. And things may not be, things may not be fair, but God is always faithful. And offering, acting off of that principle, I want to tell you about something that I told you about earlier. Uh, we kind of talked about earlier. Someone asked me about, what's the difference between the spirit and the soul? And how can we distinguish? And I got to thinking about that. And nowadays, we kind of interchange those. Do you know that they're not interchangeable? They're different. They're separate. Mm -hmm. Do, if I were to ask you, you know that, that God created man, mankind, did you know that he created, created them in a try-in situation just like the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? He created us to have a spirit. He created us to have a soul, and he created us to have a body. The triune aspect of man. So what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks is look at the triune aspects of man. And how, not, not only how God designed that, but how it plays out. Make sense? It's not intended to confuse us. And sometimes God, um, I, I ask God, you ever, you ever been around those in the medical field and they speak kind of in their own language? And you just want them to speak English. So sometimes you ask them to speak English. Um, I, I just want God to speak kindergartner <laughs> to Wayne in some spiritual things. God, just speak kindergartner to me so I can get it. And so in this process, I want, I want us to look at that this isn't God trying to speak above us. This is really God trying to challenge us to see things from his perspective. Because his perspective is different, way different than my perspective or your perspective. And I got to throw this out here too before I get too far in here and, and you start taking notes of what you want to talk to me about later. Um, I don't have the market corner on everything that God knows and has given in his word. I've never confessed that. I never believed that. I am constantly growing. And here's the, here's the deal. I encourage you to grow with me. Sometimes that means challenging you with things that you maybe have never heard before or haven't encountered before or maybe there are things that you know well and you know them better than I do and you're going to come back to me later and say hey Wayne did you think about this or did God lead you to that and I'm great with that I have no problem with it at all when we think of the spirit the soul and the body we first need to look at the spirit the spirit of mankind and what it is how it looks and then and then and and then what does it do Thomas Edison said this he said opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. <laughs> and I know that most of us, we come to, to a camera or to a place of worship, we just want to be fed. This one's going to take some work. It's going to take some digging, it's going to take some walking, take some plowing, it's take some cultivating. And I know it's not pretty, I know it's not easy, but it's important. God, in His wisdom, created mankind to be in communication with Him. He didn't create us to be robots, He didn't create us to be... Um, artificial intelligence that would simply go along to our programming. He wanted us to be those who are in communication with him constantly, completely. And, and, and here's, here's the last one. I got to have C's, three C's because it's important. Concisely. He, there's a certain way that we communicate with God. And, and here's the tricky part. I believe a lot of us in this world today, we got it wrong. We want to communicate with God on our terms, in our way. That doesn't work. It just flat doesn't work. See, the start of a relationship with God can be seen in two lines of communication. First, God drawing us to Him by His Spirit. Do you know that you can't really meet God? You can't really be one with God? You can't have a relationship with God unless the Spirit first draw you? It's fact. So as the Spirit draws me, then what do I do with it? Well, that's that second part of the communication. And it, and it hinges on Two simple things, acceptance of his sacrifice and the willingness to continue to communicate with God. And, and I know this is the first of many, so brace yourself. You cannot be a Christian, a child of God, adopted into the family of God if you miss either one of those. You can only fake it so long. You know another thing's not fair? All the people that go to church should be Christians, right? They're not. 
I've known people that have been in church most of their life for years and years and years. And suddenly they listened to that drawing of the spirit and they began to communicate with God and God, God did this outlandish thing. He showed them that they had never really walked with him. They walked around him, but they never really walked with him. Do you know that God didn't want things to be confusing? You know, sometimes we, we make things more confusing than they are. God was conveying this willingness and I, I take great depth of, of theological understanding from God's word. And every once in a while I find somebody on the outside that has that deep theological meaning too. This time it was Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and he said this, People say nothing is impossible, but I do nothing every day. See, some, that's going to hit you later, and you're going to think yeah, that was really think funny. Yeah. Some of us are going, hey, but I like doing nothing. <laughs> do you know that you can't, I wish Amanda were here, <laughs> um, you can't do nothing and walk with God? You know, that's a horrible grammatic sentence, right? You can't do it. Walking with God takes effort. It takes commitment. It, ta it takes focus. It, it takes communication with God. He doesn't give you marching orders and they last from the day that you were born to the day that you die. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes these marching orders change. Sometimes they change for you as an individual. Sometimes they change for a church. Sometimes they change for a nation. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 14. So it says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. I want to tell you, first of all, that this spirit that we have, it's a gift from God and it needs to be reconciled. We need to reconcile it with God. Now, that brings up another interesting point. Something you love to do, I'm sure. Don't you just enjoy reconciling your checkbook? Depressing. <laughs> can be very depressing. Can be very confusing. Can be very... Well, it can be a lot of things. Um, enjoyment probably isn't one of the ones that I would put on the top of that list. But there are people who love numbers and they love the calculations. They, they, they're just different. They like that stuff. See, we need to reconcile the registry that God has given us with the God who created us. Another given that I'm assuming that you understand that God created man and woman in his image. And he breathed life into them, Genesis tells us. And because God breathed life into us, he is the author and the creator of us. And because of that, he is the one that we reconcile things with, not the rest of the world. And here's another hard one. Not even with myself do I reconcile it. It doesn't have to go okay with my feelings. It doesn't have to be okay with my thoughts or desires or dreams. God knows better. And sometimes things look different. And, and sometimes in that different, he's saving me from something very, 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 very bad. Well, not only is the Spirit, the spirit is a gift to be reconciled, it's also to be received. Ecclesiastes 12.7 says this. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. And the spirit will return to God who gave it. See, it's a gift to be received. And, and, and you are one that should take homage, pay homage, open your arms to and receive that spirit. It should be a desire of us to receive the spirit that God has intended for us. You would not, and, and please listen to this, you would not have the Spirit if it had not been gifted to you by God. We get the idea that there's a lot of different arenas and we can, we can kind of pick and choose. It's like this a la carte just, it's like we went to the ice cream shop and we could just pick and choose. 
Okay, I like this, but I don't want all the sprinkles today. I just, I just want some of the sprinkles. And I, I like the chocolate chips. I want to throw them in there. And we, we can kind of pick and choose. God already ordained, preordained, preset, and, and pre-delivered to you the spirit that is intended for you. You still with me? So it's to be reconciled, it's to be received. And the next is it needs to be refurbished. Do you know there's a weird concept to us? Because we don't fix stuff anymore hardly. If it breaks, what do we do? Throw it away and buy another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. See, there needs to be this refurbishing, this regeneration, this, this rebuilding of our spirit. Because you know what happens every single day? You're under attack. To berate, to bewilder, to bemoan your spirit, to cause you to, to have angst, doubt, and fear. You know when the Bible says that, the, that Satan is alive and well and he, he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour? That's where he starts, in our spirit. If you are a child of God's and you have confessed God as your Lord and Savior and you believe that God has died on a cross for you, He can't take your soul. He can take your spirit. Number four, the spirit is a gift to be returned. Acts chapter 7 verse 59. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You remember the story in Acts? It's where Paul saw at the time. He's standing there and he's holding the coats of those who are stoning Stephen. And Stephen looks up to God and he sees God stand for him and he sees God intently. And then he offers, he gives to God his spirit. Do you know that there will be a time when your spirit is not indwelling in your earthly body? It won't be there. Stephen offers that up, and he knows that it's, it is necessary to return that to God. Ecclesiastes uh, twelve seven says it also this way. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. You know, you know what the dust is. You know what he's talking about there. This earthen vessel. It's, there's going to be a time where it returns. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. God's saying hey, there's going to be a time where, where that... That spirit, that thing that's been invested in you, goes back to God. Also, as a believer, we need to understand that we have direct communication with God, right? The Bible tells us that there was a time where, where prophets of old and Old Testament stuff, and, and you try to get through all those books, but the reality of the difference was they spoke through, through someone that was God's man. When, when Jesus died on the cross, he took the veil and tore it. So that I might, you might, we might be able to walk straight into God, right? So now we have access to Him. Because of that access, we have direct communication with God. We have this direct connection with God. You know what that direct connection is? Your spirit. That's how you connect with God. Your spirit that dwells inside of you can connect with God's spirit isn't that awesome? See, that's one of those warm, fuzzy parts, I would think. It is to me. To know that God looks at me and says, I'm worthwhile enough to communicate with. See, I won't go over the list that he has, but you don't realize that's a big deal for Wayne because uh, I miss the mark occasionally. I do some really silly things pretty often. And some of them are even by accident. Some of them I've been working out as habits for a long, long time, and I seem to do the same things over and over and over. But God looks at me and says, I still want to talk with you, Wayne. I still want to communicate with you, fill in your name, because that's exactly how he feels about you. God doesn't wait for us to clean things up before we get things fixed and right with him to communicate with us. He is in constant desire of communicating. See, there's a problem, though. As a believer, we know and understand that Direct communication, direct connection is a gift by the Spirit of God. What about those who don't believe? It's 
So here's the tough part. And maybe we could even say it's unfair. But you don't have that communication with God. You're like, well, Wayne, that's not very nice. That's not very fair. We're all inclusive. I didn't write the rules. I didn't, I didn't lay the pages out. I wish that everyone would trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because if you do, God will communicate with you. But if you are a non-believer, God is waiting for you to surrender and let Him fix your life. The first, the true communication he's listening for is for you to first confess. Trust. Believe. See, the Spirit is a gateway also. It's not just a gift. And God is not going to force, and please hear this, you can write this down too, we can discuss it at length. But God is not going to force anybody, send anybody to hell. Never has, never will. But if you choose not to walk with Him now, He will allow you to live away from Him later. You have to make that choice. You have to make that stand. You have to be willing to, to set up the line of communication and cultivate it. There has to be this gateway between you and God. What is that? Spirit. That's how He talks to us. That's how we hear Him. That's, that's how everything comes together. We must have that gateway. And the only thing that makes me different than anybody else in the world who's done any of the things that I have or worse or better <laughs> is that gateway. I'm not somebody that's got it all figured out. And, and I know this is going to be hard. It's a good thing you're sitting down. But neither are you. Stop acting like that. We're all in this together. We make lots of mistakes. And if you're one of those sitting on the side calculating the mistakes, put your pen down and be quiet. God says we need that gateway. Proverbs chapter uh, 20, verse 27 says this. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of his being. It's the way that God gets to something that's deep and meaningful. I know that's hard for us because in this world of superficial nonsense, we're not used to deep. We're not used to something valuable. Have you ever really had anything that was priceless that couldn't be replaced? No matter what money or, or certain thing, you just couldn't fix it. You couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't have that again. It was priceless. This is it. You now have that opportunity. You now have that in your, in your arsenal. You, you, still, you now have that in your being. You know what's priceless? You, the spirit that God gave you and the communication that it allows you to the most holy God. Don't let anybody take that away. And for sure, don't give it away. Holy mackerel. We're walking around like we're willing to give it just anywhere, everywhere. You're like, oh, no, we're not. Yes, we are. If we weren't, if we weren't, liquor stores wouldn't be open and church is closed. I got a whole list of the ways we've given it away lately and all of them have to do with spiritually and following what God says. And I don't even have to get too far down the road and, and talk about things like abortion or, or any of that other stuff. If you can explain to me how it's much more detrimental to come to a God's place of worship than it is to go to a liquor store, I'm all ears. Help me. But what it tells me is, the truth is, that it's Satan trying to shut down that gateway. Trying to keep us from meeting. Trying to keep us from leaning on each other. Try, trying, to, trying to wall us off. You know what they do with the weakest animal in the herd? When a group of wolves comes around? Try to separate him or her out. So they're alone, so they can be killed. Don't kid yourself. You are in a battle. We are in a battle. The Spirit is also a gateway. Look at Romans uh, 8, verse 12 through 12 and following. Um, 
I didn't actually print that one out. I'm gonna have to look at that one. Romans 12. No, Romans 8, I'm sorry. Romans 8. Eight. Eight twelve says this. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, uh, under the law, but under grace. And then, what is, what's the other one I said? Romans eight, twelve. Romans eight. I really do have it. Therefore, brethren, we are de debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So where does the spirit lead? Leads to life, leads to blessing, right? Verse 14, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. So who follows the spirit? Those who are the sons and daughters of God, right? Those who are adopted in. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness without, I mean, with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. He's saying if we'll walk with him, if we'll be connected with him, if we'll stay with him, if we'll allow our spirit to be connected with his spirit, then we are not only grafted in, but we are blessed. See, the problem with most of us is we're looking for blessing without the true benefit of being right with God. I'll translate that for you. We just want things to go well. <laughs> without too much work. That's kind of what we're aiming for. You know, I, I know someone who said, don't set the bar too high. Because that way when you miss it, you won't be as disappointed. I believe God set the bar high because he knew he, he could cultivate in us that victory. See, we need that spirit. And, and that spirit is a gateway that allows us to not only see God, understand God, walk with God, but to be victorious through God. And finally, there's this tricky part about this spiritual get gateway, and it's, it's really kind of hard to understand. Um, what happens with that spirit when we die? Where does it go? See, we don't really want to talk about that much, and I, I don't want to dwell on that or anything. We're not going to be there a long time, but, but what happens when we do die? I know the Bible tells us that we're going to stand before God and we'll be judged. And then we're going to stand before God and God will ask his son, is that one of mine? And, and, and I know this, the premise of what happens, but what happens to your spirit? See, there's a big change in that spirit. Luke chapter 23, verse 46 says this. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now, wait a minute. Why would God... Jesus, in all his glory, give up his spirit. And Jesus had cried with a loud voice. He said, Father, into thy hands commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. I believe that when God was, was allowing his son to go to that cross, he took with him all the burdens of life. All those sins, all those frailties, all those shortcomings, all the things that we had done, all the things that we would ever do, all the things that anybody anywhere ever would do. He took them all with him to the cross. Now here's the tricky part. What happens between the crucifixion and the resurrection? Three days later when he resurrected. Well, I'll tell you my version. In my version, the Bible tells me that in Revelation that, that Jesus took those who were captives and he preached to them. And that there were those who were resurrected out of that preaching. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, it gets better than that. In the process of that, 
He went there, and I'm going to tell you something I believe about why Jesus gave up the Spirit. He did it, first of all, to give us an example. Because there would be a time when we would give up the Spirit. That we would no longer need the long-distance line that allowed us to communicate with God. Why? We're about to be in His presence. We're about to be in His in, in residing with Him. John chapter 14 has told us that God has gone to a place and prepared for us a place that we might live. And if He prepares it and calls for us, we will go there. Are you still with me? You still believe in the Bible? Because that's what he's saying. So if he does that, I don't need this long distance communication thing called the Spirit that resides in me. Do I? God didn't need it because what he was doing was he, he was in that grave that he might take care of me, you, all of us on the cross for sure. But he was also to, to bridge the gap between those who were caught between two different realities. You're like, oh no, where are we going? Yeah, you have no idea. In the process of that, there had to be this coming forward of His Spirit. God didn't need nor desire a different marching order because He knew what was going on. And where was He about to be when He was resurrected? Well, he was on the road to Emmaus and He met all these people and He, he was walking with these people. No, He's about to be in the presence of God. The Bible tells me He's going to get a place of prominence at the right hand of God because He fulfilled His glory. See, when they asked him and he was walking around on the earth, what did he constantly tell people? If you have heard me, you have heard my father. He was in direct communication. Even, on, even that little event on the cross when he said, Father, if there be some other will, if there's other, some other way, if this cup can pass from me, Father, take it. But if not, not my will, but thy will. That's communication through the Spirit. You still with me? So when you pass from this life, you're not going to have that long distance communication. You're going to have one of two scenarios. One, you're going to be in the presence of God. You're going to get to talk with Him. You're going to get to hear His responses. It's, it, you're, going to, you're going to get to communicate with Him directly. The other is you will have no communication with Him. None. Zero. One of the things that I think would be most tormentous about hell is the fact that I will have no chance to see good. I will have no chance to see glory. I will have no chance to see love and feel love. You're like, now wait a minute. Well, in our world, it's pretty treacherous. Yeah, but that's, treacherous isn't the same as not having God's presence. Right now, we have hope because we have God's presence. Even in varying degrees, in various situations, in varying parts of the world. But we have hope and we can feel and sense. Do you know what the oppressive feeling will be like when there is no touch? of God's love. But that's your choice. But can I say something? And I really do mean this in love. But if you don't want to walk with God now and you don't want to listen to His Spirit, you don't want to communicate with Him through the, the communication lines that He's set up, why are you complaining about it? Just go on and do it. Why are people in the world trying to convince us to live some other way? If we really do believe live and let live, why don't we let people worship, live, love, serve the way God intended it? Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers in higher places. And because of that, Satan is not just going to lay down and let you talk to God. Not going to happen. I need that gateway. I need it every day. I need it on Tuesday afternoon when none of you are around. I need it a lot on Sunday morning when God's trying to speak through this feeble vessel. And I know that life's not fair. I know it's not, not right in a lot of our eyes. But, but the bottom line is, what should we do about it? What should we do with this spirit now that we understand that it's valuable and it is integral in who we are? Well, I think it's pretty simple. We should follow Jesus. We should communicate First of all, so we're on his marching orders. We should communicate, second of all, until we get through with the path that God has here on earth. And then eventually we should give it up in glory. Take that spirit, Lord. I'm done with that. I'm really going to crawl up in your lap. I'm honestly going to sit there and share my heart because you know it anyway. But what does following Jesus' example look like? 
See, I think the first thing may be a problem. I hate to begin with a problem, but sometimes you got to get past the problem to get to the solution. The problem is maybe we don't cherish that spirit. We don't protect it from the things we look at. We don't protect it from the things we listen to. We don't promote it as being valuable. Maybe we should look at some way of making it something that we cherish. See, this is a part where I could get into a whole lot of things. And I even thought of a list. I have a bunch of them flashing through my mind right now of things we cherish. When I was 15, I, well, I wanted my driver's license bad. I was cherishing the moment that I got a car. Didn't matter that if I let go of the steering wheel, it'd dart off the road to the left because the front end was wrecked. I still cherish that. I cherish getting older and making decisions. I, I mean, I cherish lots of things. I cherish the day that my, my kiddos were born. I cherish the day that I get to marry my wife. I cherish lots of things in life. I even once cherished the Cowboys. I'm sorry, that was too much, wasn't it? <laughs> but, but somewhere in here, we've placed God on the back burner that we'll walk by Him on a Sunday instead of cherishing Him every moment of every day in everything that we do. That's why God put that Spirit in you. So we need to cherish it. We also need to let it challenge us. And we need to challenge it. I want you to pray a prayer with me sometime during this week. If you're bold enough, if you're brave enough, I'd encourage you to pray it. God, I challenge you to show me your spirit and to let your spirit move mightily in my, in my life. Simple prayer. You do that. Did I ever tell you about the time I prayed for patience? <laughs> I think it's going to be the same kind of scenario. Next week you can tell me all about it because it's going to be like this ah, moment. It'll be awesome. And we'll all celebrate. See, the problem is sometimes we don't communicate with God, not because we don't believe He won't do something. It's because we don't down deep really want Him to do something. Let Him challenge you. He'll make you into somebody you never thought you could be. All those naysayers that say you're this way or that way or you're this or that or you've been dealt this or that and it makes you a particular way, that's garbage. Last thing. Cherish it. Challenge it. I know this is going to sound similar, but we got to cultivate it. I started this by saying, I run and do these other things. Why do I do those things? Am I mad at myself? Do I just dislike myself that much? Maybe. It's not much fun sometimes. But I have realized this through life. Sometimes you have to go through the difficult times to get to the fun times. Sometimes you have to go through the painful times to get to the prosperous times. Sometimes you have to get, sometimes you have to get through the low points to get to sit on the mountaintop. But if we never till the ground for the fertile seed of Jesus Christ, it will not grow. It will not grow. I wish there was so much more. This, this, as I, as I said earlier, this is not, this is not a, an all-inclusive. This is very a snippet of what the Spirit's all about. So much more. What do you do with it? Father God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the opportunities that you give us. I thank you that, that even though I've st staggered through life for 40 years as your child, that you're still desiring to grow me. You still, you still have this line of communication. I pray, Lord, that we would see and sense and understand your speaking, your voice clearer than we ever have. That we would be strong enough to take a step just one step today toward you. And that through that, we would see your favor, see your blessing, see your mighty hand move. Lord, there are so many today, whether in this place or around this world, who are hurting, desperately, desperately hurting. 
Lord, help us to be the conduit that, that your spirit speaks to our spirit and we speak on your behalf. We love you and we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.